So this is what I want to talk about today, though, is the leverage lifestyle, okay? How do we find opportunities, whether it's in the natural world, whether it's in our social world, whether it's in the technological world, to optimize and maximize our impact, okay? So, as Stephen so graciously said, my name is Alex Angel. I am a proud Midwestern man. Grew up in northern Indiana, spent some time in Wisconsin, got folks in North Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, Michigan. So, this is my homeland, and I'm very happy to be at Camp 5 Midwest. So, a little bit about me. As Stephen said, I am a two time Camp Fi attendee. This is now my third Camp Fi, so I'm very happy to be spending it with all of you here this weekend. Um, I am the premier child, ranked number one <laughs> of four. So um, yes, I have, I have three that have followed me, but we'll see if they can step up uh, to my level. Um, and I will say that I am afflicted. I am a perpetual student. So my most visited websites, it was so embarrassing to look at, but it's Wikipedia and YouTube. And I'm out there and I'm learning and I'm reading every moment I can possibly get. So that's a little bit about me. Um, but there's another, there's another thing I think that's important to share with you guys about me. On March 12th, 2023, I became the fastest man on earth. So Stephen didn't know about this before, but you know, I figured it'd be a good, good little surprise for him. You can see with this, peak physical form that I have before you, <laughs> svelte, sleek body. I am built like a sprinter and an athlete. But do not despair, for I have video proof. <laughs> <clears throat> so, as you can see in that video, I propelled myself at exceptional speed. Um, also, if any of you guys happen to know a NFL recruiter, um, I'm, I'm also open to be a linebacker too. So I said I was looking for a job yesterday, potentially. You know, if you know anybody in the NFL, just, uh, just give me a ring. So, fastest man on earth. So that's the, that's the quickest a person can possibly go. And you might be wondering, Alex, that was pretty quick. But I think I've seen some people go a little bit faster. Yeah, like this guy, Usain Bolt. He's pretty fast. I kicked his butt. <clears throat> you're like, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? So I want to introduce a little bit of uh, some physics. So don't get too scared here. I should be able to explain it nice and succinct and easy for you. So in physics, we have what's called a frame of reference. Okay, Every time you're going to do some basic mechanics, a little bit of calculations, you're going to set a frame of reference. You're going to set a stationary object. So imagine when you're driving in a car down the highway and there's cars passing you, it looks like they're going, you know, they're just kind of scooting past you. You know, a little bit faster, a little bit slower, you're going the same. But if you were to stand on the road and look at all the cars on the highway, they're all going really fast past you, right? And so that's two different frames of reference. One, standing on the side of the road, and the other, being in the car next to another car driving. Okay, so that's the first thing. So when we think about the world and the planet, there's a couple different ways that we can think of frames of reference. All right, and I like to be a little bit, hmm, what can we call it? I like woo, okay, a little bit of woo. So how about we set a celestial frame of reference, all right? We'll hold the, the constellations constant, all right? And, and we'll do all of our math and all of our calculations from the frame of reference of all the stars, okay. So next thing I want to introduce to you is some simple physics. So this right here is a simple diagram of a lever, all right? You apply a force on one side and you get a result on the other. Now the more you move the fulcrum, say to one side, you can, you can put that force down on one end and you'll get a much mo bigger movement on the other. Now if you take that concept and apply it to circles or the angular dimension, um, you can increase your lever by going further and further out. Such as, you know, when you're on a merry-go-round as a kid, if you're at the center, everything's chill, you go out at the end, oh my gosh, you're going to die, you're going to get thrown off the merry-go-round, it's crazy, crazy, insane. But the, uh, the object is spinning at the same speed the whole time. So I went and I applied that concept to the Earth. So this here is a polar projection of Earth. So we're looking straight down the North Pole, right, right through the axis. And just like on that merry-go-round, the further out you go on this, um, on this map here, the faster 
you are spinning, or the faster the tangential velocity is while you're on Earth. And at the very, very end of that, um, of that map there is the equator. So that, that marks the absolute furthest out that you can go, the fastest on the merry-go-round that you can possibly get. And so, there's a couple other things you could do here. <clears throat> so this is a quick little diagram that I pulled off of Wikipedia of some uh, important mountains. You know, you might recognize some, such as Everest. Those of you who have been to Hawaii uh, might recognize Mauna Kea. Um, but there's also two more. So there's Mount Chimborazo, which is in Ecuador, and it's the furthest point from the center of the Earth, which is cool, but not important to what I'm, you know, considering here. What I was interested in was Volcan Cayembe, also in Ecuador. And the peak of Volcan Cayembe is the point on Earth at which your tangential velocity is the highest. Nowhere else. It is the combination of closeness to the equator and elevation. Okay, so that's the best combination you can possibly get. So, of course, I had to visit. <clears throat> so, um, unfortunately, I am not a skilled mountaineer, okay? And uh, the top of that mountain isn't very flat or conducive to running, so I did a little bit of a compromise. Um, it's on the other side of that mountain. This is, this is a view from the north. But on, on the other side of the mountain, there's a, little, there's, there's, there's a little flat spot. There's a little flat spot up there. And so what I did is... Uh, is I ran up there with one of my friends, um, and we, we took, a little, took a little mountain buggy up there and made it up, made it up to that flat point. They got a little refuge up there, a little, little mountain chalet. It's kind of nice. You cannot breathe worth a darn. Um, and I found a flat spot, and I, and I laid, out, laid out a little racetrack for myself, okay, about 25 meters in length. And, uh, and that's what you saw in that video uh, a couple minutes ago was that little racetrack that I la laid out. And so what's important about that, though, is uh, a little bit of vector addition, right? So I was talking about that's the point at which <laughs> <coughs> the Earth is spinning the fastest, okay? And then if you take my velocity plus the Earth's velocity, you get the fastest man on Earth, okay? <laughs> so um, I woke up at like 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, did a little bit of math, okay? A little bit of backhand calculations, pulled up some, uh, some old uh, astronomical appendices and stuff like that, grabbed the values out of there, crunched the numbers, crunched the data, um, and added up. And I was like, okay, I think, I think I'll go really, really freaking fast if I do this. So here's some of the results from, uh, from, my, from my race here. So you'll see that uh, as I was running eastward, now this is important, I was running eastward. If you were to add my velocity to that of the Earth, I was traveling approximately 469 meters per second. Now, for those of you who are unaware of the metric system or not as familiar, that's approximately 1,060 miles per hour, or Mach 1.4. So, <clears throat> uh, I was hauling ass. Um, <laughs> Now you'll see here, there's a couple other runners on here, some, some professional athletes, if you will. Um, Mr. Roach, he came pretty close. He, he came pretty, pretty close, but he couldn't quite get her done. And Usain Bolt, he just nowhere to be seen. Okay. <laughs> so, of course, uh, I had to uh, award myself, um, you know, my little, my little trophy there. So, this is what I want to talk about today, though, is the leverage lifestyle, okay? How do we find opportunities, whether it's in the natural world, whether it's in our social world, whether it's in the technological world, to optimize and maximize our impact, okay? So, before you get away with anything, when I'm talking about the leverage lifestyle, I'm not talking about 2008, okay? Not talking about real estate today, all right? This is, uh, this is the leverage I'm not quite as familiar with, okay? We'll just put it that way. Um, but what is the leverage lifestyle? So the leverage lifestyle is the application of small and intentional thoughts, ideas, and actions that have outsized returns in happiness, meaning, and life satisfaction. So the, life, the leverage lifestyle framework. Okay, so it has three components. First off, set the frame of reference. Frame of reference is very important. Second off, adjust the fulcrum. Okay, so take it from that middle point out to the end. Maybe turn it into the whole gosh darn globe. And then, of course, importantly, run like hell. Give it the maximum effort that you possibly can. So when we think back to that table, what happened? How was I able to beat these world-class athletes? Well, Mr. Bolt, for instance, 
He can run like hell, okay? He could kick my butt any day of the week. He'll probably be 85 years old and still able to run faster in a straight line than I can. But you see, Mr. Bolt, when he set this record right here, this was his 9.58 100-meter dash. That was in Berlin, Germany, which is at latitude 53 degrees north. He's not going to have the speed of the earth to help propel him forward. Low leverage opportunity there. Mr. Roach, he did a little bit better. So he's a Chilean athlete, and back in 1998, he was racing in the Ecuadorian city of Cuenca, okay, which is a couple hundred miles south of uh, Cayembe. And um, he did pretty good there, too. He had about a 10-second 100 meter. Um, but the thing is, he was running north and south, not east and west with the planet, right? So it's important to think about those little tiny details, right, to propel yourself to that next level. Okay, so what are some of the areas that I'm applying this framework to my life? And maybe you could apply it to your life as well. So then I'm gonna be talking about three different areas. First off is gonna be fitness, and then a little bit of education, and then lastly, community. Okay, fitness. Look at this dude, he's freaking jacked. I'd kinda like to be jacked like that, wouldn't you? Unfortunately, not all of us are blessed with such gorgeous genetics. We may be able to work, some of us might not be able to achieve that, but you know, it's still an aspiration. <sighs> Unfortunately, some of us are corn-fed Midwesterners. <laughs> so that's made especially, especially difficult. <clears throat> now, I've, uh, I've gone through a number of fitness cycles in my life, off and on, off and on. This is, you know, sort of a reflection of, of that. You know, sometimes I'm better, sometimes I'm lower. This could also be my weight too. You know, go up and down, up and down here, and back and forth, back and forth. Um, you know, I've tried things like a little bit of CrossFit. So, you know, do some, some wall balls and playing on the rig and stuff like that. It's a good time. CrossFit's a, a great, great time. But, you know, that can get a little bit pricey from time to time. Um, you know, gone to the, the student recreational center. You know, that's a, that's a good one. But, you know, sometimes it's just, you got to know what you're doing there, right? Um, you know, there's not always the support. There's fun, great people there, great people at the, uh, at the student rec center, but you got to know what you're doing. Um, and I even for a little bit uh, was on the, on the crew team at, uh, at the university. And so um, I was in their trial period. They were also really expensive. It was like $3,000 for a semester to be on the crew team. I'm like, no, thank you. I cannot afford that as an 18 year old. <laughs> so I stayed, I stayed uh, until they, uh, they said I had to pay up. And so then, I, <laughs> so then I left. So those were three different you know, sorts of opportunities that I've tried to look at with fitness. None of them really stuck. Um, and so that led me to a little bit of a, you know, a, a not so happy place, right? Because I'm looking at these people, absolute studs, looking jacked. And I'm like, man, I, I really want to be like that. And it's, it's weighing on my soul, it's weighing on my heart. And I'm not getting anywhere. And so that's when I decided, you know what, it's probably time for me to change my frame of reference. And so some wise guy once said, don't compare yourself to where others are today, compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Right? And so in adopting that framework, I'm able to then take inspiration from other people, but not take comparison. Okay. Second thing in the framework is adjust the fulcrum. Okay? So what can we move around to help us get better impact? First and foremost, I recommend getting a gym buddy. So this is my gym buddy. His name is Caleb. He is a wonderful man, father of two. Um, and he is, he's, he's, ab he's absolutely wonderful. Gym guy, he's been going no matter what, every single day of the week. He will text you at 7 p.m. and be like, bro, get to the gym. Okay, so that works for me, right? Because I need to have another person there. That's just how my psychology works. And so having him there, fantastic. Second thing I like to have is some advanced AI technology. So um, I'm using an application called Juggernaut AI, and it basically tells me exactly what I need to do every single day. So that way I don't have to think about it. I already have the plan. It's ready to go. It adapts to how I'm feeling, the number of calories that I've eaten, the amount of sleep that I've gotten. It told me one day, dude, you're not allowed to work out because you haven't gotten enough sleep. And I said, okay, I, uh, I can go take a nap. So adjust in the fulcrum and then run like hell. So I've been following this program now for probably seven, eight months, which was the longest I've stayed on a consistent program uh, for anything, you know, whether it's that CrossFit, whether it's that rowing, uh, what have you. And so I've seen some good results on that. Uh, this is my squat from a couple weeks ago. It's closer to 340 nowadays. Um, so what's that, in about eight months, 
add 60, 65 pounds to your squat. Um, so just by following this program, having these systems in place, uh, I think I've been able to achieve a little bit of my own personal fitness goals. All right, second area I'd like to talk about is education. So uh, I am an educational addict, and for a person on the FI path, it's pretty rough. If you like formal education, um, it can be expensive nowadays, right? So this is just the, uh, the consumer price index for education here, and as you can see, oh my goodness, it has shot through the roof over the last decade, okay? So education is more expensive than ever, which can kind of be an impediment to someone like me who really, really likes to be in a classroom. Um, and uh, yeah, students aren't really known for being all that, all that wealthy either, and so you run into a little bit of a conundrum. And so that led me to then changing my frame of reference, right? And so I found this quote from a, a former president's lesser known Fi-minded brother, John Fi Kennedy, and he said, ask not how you can pay for school, ask how school can pay for you. So, adjust the fulcrum, what do we do? Three things, first off, look at tuition and expenses, Second thing, scholarships and grants, and third, assistantships. First off, tuition and expense. So I decided to go to the premier educational institution, not only in the Midwest, but also in the United States, and perhaps the world, Purdue University, boiler up. Um, Purdue is known for holding tuition constant for the last 12 years, which kind of helps someone who's looking to uh, save a couple bucks on education. Um, if, as you can see here, for an Indian, Indiana resident such as myself, it's about $10,000 a year in tuition. All right. Second thing you can do is look for scholarships and grants. Most powerful tool I have found is the four-year renewable scholarship from the school, all right? So at Purdue University, they have two for undergraduates. One's called the Trustee Scholarship, the other is called the Presidential Scholarship. You know, they have different levels, um, and they award them to different students in different departments. So it's not a whole university, it's the university goes and distributes an equal amount to different departments in different colleges. So that leads me to my next point. A lot of public colleges and universities have data and reporting requirements, okay? So you can go in and look at some of their statistics. And so what I did, as I said, I really like science. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at all the different science majors and see what, which one looks kind of good to me. But then I saw this chart, and this is admissions data right here. So these taller bars right here are the number of total applicants. And then in the middle right here is the number of admitted, all right? And you'll see that at the Purdue College of Science, it's approximately 50% of the applying students are admitted. Okay, so, you know, that's a that's pretty stiff competition for a public university. All right, now, if we look at the College of Agriculture, however, we can see that it's approximately 80 to 90% of the applicants are admitted. Now, I will say the College of Agriculture is excellent because they have all the science you could possibly need. We've got meteorology, we've got geology, we've got all sorts of different biology, some social science as well, too. Um, and so the College of Agriculture presented a little bit of a leverage point for me. And so I applied to the College of Agriculture because then I could be a stronger candidate and increase my probability of receiving a larger scholarship. Okay, now that took care of the, the undergraduate funding. Let's talk a little bit about graduate school. So as the, uh, as the educational addict I am, I could not stop with just the BS degree. I had to get the Master of Science as well. And so there's two different ways that you can pay for a graduate degree that I know of. Uh, first off is with a research assistantship, and secondly is with a teaching assistantship. So a little bit of a strategy for a research assistantship, if you're not aware, that is when a professor hires a graduate student to do work in his or her lab. Where does this money come from? Well, these, this money comes from the federal government. Now, this, this is a chart of, uh, of grants dispersed by different federal agencies to uh, different faculty in, at Purdue University. Um, and by using this chart, you can look at who's got the money. You can follow the money, you can see who has the money, who has the funding opportunities for you to get your education paid for. All right, now, my most favoritest, favoritest hack in the whole wide world is the teaching assistantship, namely the quarter-time teaching assistantship. For just 10 hours a week, where I get to go and I get to talk to all my students, get to interact with each and every one of them, learn their names, learn about their, their life, their dreams, ambitions, teach them science, I get my entire tuition paid for and a couple grand every month. So, you can get higher levels, you can get a half time, you can get a three quarter time if you want, that's awesome, but I found that the dollar per hour rate is approximately $52 per hour for a quarter time position. Now, I don't know how many other opportunities you have as like a 22, 23 year old to make that sort of money right out the gate, but I would, uh, I would go and investigate that if you are interested in pursuing higher education. Um, 
This is just a little bit of uh, some of the run like hell that I did uh, when it came to scholarships. So this is just sort of my, my pegboard of all the different scholarships that I applied for and was awarded. Uh, I do have systems for those, and if you're interested, please talk to me later. Um, I also applied for grants as well, so here's some of the grant funds that I was able to accumulate for my undergraduate studies. Um, and then, of course, there's me in the classroom with all of my students doing the assistantship. All right, lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about community. So I am what I would like to call an extreme extrovert, okay? Anytime I do any sort of personality assessment, I'm in the 90th to 100th percentile. In this most recent one, I was 92nd percentile. So I absolutely love people. There was me at Camp Fi up in Florida uh, earlier this year. Um, now, unfortunately, I live in the Midwest, right? And so everything's not all sunshine and rainbows. This is the end of March, and it's cloudy, overcast, and snowy, all right? So that kind of weighs on my soul a little bit, right? It kind of hurts a little bit. And it's made worse when you got nonsense like COVID where it shuts everything down, okay? So your sense of community struggles a little bit. And as an extrovert, I'm extra attuned to that sort of a problem. <clears throat> And so I had to change my frame of reference again. And I, said, I had to say, even if I can't meet folks in person, you know, in this COVID, relationships can be fostered in many different ways, even if in person is objectively the best. Um, so what did I do? I adjusted the fulcrum uh, to, help, uh, to help build my community. So first off, you know, you're attending events. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about creating events. And then lastly, how do we maintain these relationships from these events? So first off, attending events. Now, y'all have uh, done the massive step here, the 80-20 rule, you've attended the event. You've showed up here to Camp Fi, so I'm very happy to see all of you here. But you know, when you go back to your homes, there's not always sort of fine-minded people all around, and you might be looking for other sources of community. And just so for me, I tend to find that source of community at my church. Uh, you may uh, find it somewhere else, but um, just going to a place where there's other people congregating tends to help with building community. Um, now, the second thing is creating events. What I like to think of a little hack here is everybody has to eat, okay? Um, some people can hold out longer than others, but at one point or another, they're going to crack, and you're going to have to have some food. And where are the people you like to hang out with, right? So just kind of think about that. And then maintaining relationships. So some of the things I've noticed for adjusting the fulcrum there is things like asking questions, right, and asking to follow up. Hey, how are you doing? How was your day? Oh, you know, it was pretty good. Um, you know, I got this promotion at work. Tell me more about that, right? It's that tell me more. Use that, and it really helps with getting your conversations going and flowing. Um, remember, you have two ears and one mouth, so just sit there. Let the silence permeate a little bit, okay? Listen to what the other person has to say. Uh, and then thirdly, take the initiative and reach out, right? Go and talk to someone, um, and you be that change in the world. All right, so when it comes to running like hell, putting in that effort, what do I do? Create events. Now, I'm going to totally steal this from my roommate here. He had this brilliant strategy. He's like, I want to meet a bunch of really cool people who are like dialed in, doing a great job in life. So what's he do? He goes to the gym at 5.55 in the morning and he walks up to every single person in the gym and he says, hi, <clears throat> I think you're pretty cool. Would you like to come to my house for lunch? <laughs> <clears throat> and so, uh, so what this then turned into was every day at 11.30 at uh, Casa de Angelo, we had lunch. And so this was, this was all throughout uh, this last year of grad school and hopefully coming into this next year, uh, we, have a, we have a set time, right? It's not always the same people every time, but it builds that community when they have that set time to show up, share those like-minded ideas with each other, and it's, and it's really, really great. So I would recommend maybe you, uh, you try that in your own home community. All right, second thing, reaching out. Um, so this is a little bit of my screen time. I was looking at it. Um, most of my screen time on that phone right there is spent on things such as messaging, WhatsApp, and phone calls about seven or eight hours a week. Okay, so just kind of going through. I got like 600 contacts, so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta talk to them sometimes. So just kind of go out there. And if, if making a phone call is too much, that's okay. Because what you can do is something I like to call positivity texts. Okay, so some of you may have been a recipient of an Alex Angel positivity text before, but when it's gloomy, it's gray, it's a horrible December day. I like to send a little bit of positivity out into the out into the universe. And so here's some screenshots just from some folks that you know you just it's something simple, right? I hope you're having a great day. Maybe sunshine, some rainbows. I hope you're having a happy Thursday. Just easy little things. You know, and sometimes it progresses into some big old conversations. Sometimes it's just a quick little back and forth to let them know you care. Okay? So, action item for y'all today, sometime this weekend. I hope that you could message or call someone, a friend, a spouse, coworker, child, and spread a little bit of positivity. Okay? If you could do that for me, that would, that would make my heart feel so full this weekend. Help spread a little bit of positivity. And maybe this winter, you know, when it gets all cloudy and gray and miserable, and maybe in mud season too, when it's even worse, um, if, you could, if you could go and spread a little bit of positivity, I would really, really appreciate that. So, 
Going forth, as you're sending those positivity texts, remember to apply the leverage lifestyle framework. First off, set the frame of reference. Secondly, adjust the fulcrum. And third, run like hell. If you'd like to connect with me, I am at Geography on Instagram. Um, I am on a mission to visit all of the counties in these United States. And so uh, that's why I needed that sailboat. I asked for that sailboat because there's some counties that are kind of like aquatic and so I can't really drive to them. Um, so I'm just trying to uh, find ways to connect with people across wide geographies. So thank you very much for your time and attention today. I really and sincerely appreciate it. Thank you.